Judges chapter 3. Sin is not forbidden. <laughs> sin is not. <laughs> what is sin? <laughs> sin is not bad because it's forbidden. Sin is forbidden because it's bad. That's it. Sin is not <laughs> Sin is not bad because it's forbidden. Sin is forbidden because it's bad. Would you say it with me so I won't forget it? Sin is not bad because it's forbidden. Sin is forbidden because it's bad. A simple truth that we've talked about a lot, and we ought to know very well. In reality, though, many people are still confused about that. They feel as though God capriciously determines certain things to be verboten, forbidden. And because he declared those things are forbidden, that's why they're bad. Not so, not true. Our God is a loving Father who cares about me and cares about you and wants us to prosper and do well. And so there are certain things that he knows will be destructive and detrimental. Certain things that he knows will cause pain and sorrow. And because of his great love for you and his love for me, our Father says these things are to be avoided. I forbid them because they're bad. They're not bad because I forbid it. I forbid it because it will be heartbreaking and gut-wrenching and life-ruining for you. See, whether you sin or not, here's what you need to know. God's love for you, God's love for me is unconditional. He loves us. Whether we're walking tightly with the Lord or wandering away from the Lord, his love is unconditional. But the issue is, hey, if I wander away and get involved in sin, it's going to cause me pain and sorrow and sadness, ultimately. And he's a father who is grieved, not grieved with me when I sin, but grieved for me. That's why the Bible says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. It's not that he's grieved with me or mad at me. He's grieved for me. He's concerned about me. He knows what sin will do. He's a father. Just like, just like my son, Peter John, when we first moved up to the Little Applegate Valley, uh, he was a little toddler, a little guy, and that first springtime, Peter went out into the pasture where we were living at that time, out in the sticks, and, and I thought that he was going to go up to one of the cows that he was watching week after week through the sliding glass door that was there in the little cabin that we were in, looking out over the pasture where the cows were grazing constantly. And I thought he was going to go find Daisy or Bessie or one of those cows and pet them, but that's not what he did. You've heard me tell the story. He went for the closest metal muffin he could find, and he stuck his hand right in. Well, I went up to Peter John, who was a toddler who couldn't yet talk, and I said, no, Peter, no, no, no. And he looked at me, and his chin quivered a bit, and he walked away a couple of steps away from my direction and found another pasture patty and put both hands in. And he looked up at me rather defiantly as though, Daddy, you great big killjoy, you don't, you don't know, you don't understand, you don't realize the, the ecstasy and the joy, and the pleasure, the sensation of warm cow patties going through your fingers and under your nails. Oh, you can squeeze it and touch it and mold it and the aroma and moisture. Oh, my daddy, such pleasure. Oh, oh, it's so grand. It's so glorious. See, that's what he thought as a little guy, as a toddler. But I had to go over there and take his hand and slap it and say, no, Peter, you're not going to put your hand in the metal muffin. No, no, no. He couldn't understand that as a little guy. He thought I was a great big meanie. But you know what? Peter John is 24 now, and now he agrees with me. <laughs> 
as he's gotten older, <laughs> as life is unfolded, Peter John realizes, you know, Father, he knows best. Dad was right about that. I, I agree now. You know, pasture patties, they're, they're not real cool. In fact, they stink. In fact, there's diseases and germs therein. There's problems. I'll get sick and I'll gross people out too. If at 24 I have pasture patties all over me. He knows that to be true. And you see, now at this point, it's not that I have to check in his room, you know, go to his apartment and look under his bed and see, hey, is Peter, do you have pasture patties stowed away someplace? See, no, he understands, and that's what life is for you and me spiritually. At first we say, how come I can't go there? How come I can't do that? Oh, that's legalistic. This is mean. But as you grow up and see life unfold, you come to the conclusion, gotcha, I see what that does, that thing that God has forbidden. Now I see what it does over the long haul. It makes people sick. It wipes people out. And it just plain is gross and stinky, ultimately. Now, most of us are learning that. Virtually all of us that have walked with the Lord for any length of time at all are learning observationally and experientially that sin does stink. It is dangerous and detrimental and damaging. It's not cool. Oh, the Bible does say to you and me, there is pleasure in sin for a season. And that's true. There is an initial ecstasy or, or a joy initially. But after that comes destruction. So we're learning. Lord, got it. Your ways are right. You love me to death and you care about me so passionately. You died to pay the price for my sin. It's forgiven. It's washed away. But not only am I redeemed by your blood, but you want to sanctify me, set me apart, make me free day after day from those things that would damage and defile and destroy me and my family. But how does that happen? Most of us at times realize that, yes, I want to be free from that stuff, but frankly, this sin, this issue, is a huge, huge, huge battle for me. It demands and it, and it, it dictates my, my thoughts and my activities. Oh, certain things are no problema, but, but there's an issue or two that I always seem to be struggling through or succumbing to. What can I do about the big sin, the heavyweight stuff? Oh, others might not know. I might have it covered fairly well. Others might not be all that aware. But I know within my soul that there is an issue. There is an oppressive weight. There is a sin that seems to dominate. What can I do if there's such a thing in your life? or if you've ever wrestled with a specific sin, and I think all of us have, all of us do, here's good news for me, good news for you. Check this out. Our story deals with just that. Take a look with me at Judges chapter 3. They were oppressed and in bondage to a real heavyweight his name, well, we'll see. The children, verse 12, of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. God's children, the Israelites, the Jewish people, did evil in his sight. That is, what they were doing was heartbreaking to the Father because his children were putting their hands in the meadow muffins, so to speak, in the pasture patties, if you would. They were involved in evil, and God knew what that would do. It would destroy them. And so God is going to do something here to bring correction for them. The Lord, verse 12 says, strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. God is raising up the Moabite king, whose name was Eglon, to be an instrument of discipline of chastening. That is, God's kids are going to get spanked, disciplined, because they keep plunging into sin. And God's heart is broken concerning his children, knowing what sin will do to them. In the book of Hebrews, 
it says to you and me that whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. I'm reading, don't turn there, just mark it if you wish. Hebrews 12, 6, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. That means spanks. And he scourges every son. If you be without chastisement, then you are bastards and not sons at all. God loves you and me so much that if we get out of line, he will chasten us. He will spank us. He will scourge us. He will discipline us. If you're here today and you say, hey, I'm doing what I want, when I want, where I want, with who I want, and hey, I'm not getting disciplined. I'm not getting spanked. I've got terrible news for you. It means that you are spiritually a bastard. You are illegitimate. You are not a true son or daughter of God. If you are getting away with sin continually and not being dealt with and being chastened, don't rejoice in that, but may it cause you to be very concerned today because what the Bible says is it's an indication that you're not one of his children. When my kids get out of line, I spank them when they were little and growing up, or ground them when they got older. I don't do that with the neighborhood children. They're not my problem, so to speak. I've got my five that I am in charge of, that I am responsible to raise up. I don't go down the street and looking for kids that are talking back or not doing what they're not supposed to and take out the wooden spoon and paddle them or give a lecture to them. It's not my responsibility. They're not my children. And so too, God says, I will deal with my children. If they're out of line, I love them, and so I will bring discipline and scourging to them because I want to protect them from further danger, from further destruction. If anyone is listening in this amphitheater or down by the burger thing or over the hill or over the airwaves, and you say, I'm sinning, and it doesn't seem to cause any repercussions for me. Be careful. It could be that you are not a child of God at all. And should your life end today, you would not be in heaven. You would be separated from him eternally. Well, be that as it may, God cared about his kids. So he strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab. Now, for you Bible students, Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 9 God says to the Israelites, his kids, do not mess with the Moabites. I have given them that land for their possession. You are not to meddle with them or cause distress to them. Listen, the Moabites, God says to his kids, don't bother them. They're not my children. Don't distress them. Let them do whatever they choose to. Don't go into their territory. They're in a whole different category, you see. So here God, with his kids now, is raising up a Moabite, the king of the Moabites named Eglon. What a great name. It describes him perfectly. He's shaped like a giant egg. He's the only man in the Bible who's called a very fat man. This guy is huge. Now, we're not talking overweight by a couple hundred pounds. We're talking, well... Jabba the Hutt, if you happen to see Star Wars, remember Jabba? Blah. I mean, this guy is gigantic. We're not talking heavy or fat. We're talking beyond obese. We're talking planet. We're talking his own zip code. We're talking Jabba the Hutt. You see, this guy is giant. He's the only guy in the Bible who's ever singled out as being a fat man. He was very fat. Now, this guy, Eglon, raised up or allowed by the Lord to be the instrument of discipline for God's children who were getting into trouble again. So, Eglon, what does he do? He was raised up, verse 13, and he, Eglon, gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek, the Ammonites and the Amalekites, two other nations that were perpetual enemies of the people of Israel, and... Eglon led the Moabites, his people, and the Ammonites, and the Amalekites, all enemies of Israel, and went up and smote Israel. 
and possessed the city of palm trees. The city of palm trees is Jericho. If you go to Jericho, and we do every time we go to Israel, it's an oasis town. It's got springs that come up and, and trees that are beautiful and vegetation all around. It's a grand town there in the desert area down by the, by the Dead Sea area. Jericho, interesting. That's the place that Eglon took. He got his allies together, the Ammonites and the Amalekites, along with his group, the Moabites, and they spanked Israel, and they took over the city of Jericho. Why? I suggest to you because Eglon wanted some fresh fruits and vegetables. I mean, Jericho was the place where, hey, food was growing, where there was an abundance of stuff to eat continually. Around the calendar year, you see, always stuff to eat, burgers and French fries and shakes and what have you. So the children, verse 14 of Israel, served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. Eglon is dominating their country, this great big job of the hut character. He's dictating over God's children, has domination there in Israel, ruling from Jericho. After 18 years, verse 15 says, finally, the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. They had enough. 18 years of being dominated by this fat guy. 18 years of this guy controlling and dictating and dominating them. Enough is enough. And finally, they cry to the Lord. And that's what happens to you and me. We're his children. But the thing that comes into our lives, the thing that we've allowed to be enthroned in our hearts, that sin that stuff, that thing, it begins to dominate. And finally, after time, you say like they did that day, enough, I'm sick of this. I'm tired of this junk. I'm sick of this sin. And you too, like me, like they did in this story, you cry out to the Lord in sincerity. No longer is it just an occasional, Lord, I know this isn't very good, forgive me, but rather, Lord, I can't stand this. It's got to go, this, this fat, oppressive sin, this heavyweight thing, this Eglon that dominates over me. They cry to the Lord. You get to that place of finally crying, and that's when the Father begins to move, you see. Like there at the kitchen table when I was growing up, we would sit there around the table and I was little and, and, oh, maybe like six or seven or so, and my sister Nikki was about ten. She sat next to me. Jimmy was three, and my brother Dave, oh, he was about 12 or 13. And we'd be sitting there eating our spaghetti, meal after meal, and then I could just, oh, I can't explain it. I could just feel underneath the table, from across the table, my brother pointing his finger at me underneath the table. I just knew it. I could sense it. It was burning a hole through my gut. And I would peek, and I'd see the finger there pointing at me. And I'd say, Mom, Dave's pointing at me. <laughs> Dave, cut that out, she would say. I'm, Dave would just kind of throw up his hands like this, and we'd have some more spaghetti. But 10 minutes later or so, I could feel the finger once more burning a hole through my gut. I knew it was there. I, sure enough, there it was once again. Mom, Dave is pointing at me. Johnny, just ignore him. Eat your spaghetti. Come on now, Dave. He would just do this kind of thing, you know, eat away. This would go on three, four, five times, finally in total frustration. Mom, Dave is pointing at me. And she would... My mom would put her fork down or whatever. That's it, she would say. John, just eat your spaghetti. Dave, to your room. Victory. <laughs> he was cast out into darkness. <laughs> Sent away and banished for that meal anyway. And, and, and that's the idea here, see? There comes a point when you truly say, this has got to stop. I can't go on. This mustn't continue anymore. A lot of people, frankly, a lot of times we don't see deliverance because we're not really desperate in desiring to see victory. 
We, we, we feel bad about getting caught or we think this probably ought not to be. But there comes a moment in a man's life, in a woman's life, when a person finally says, that is enough. It's got to go. And finally, when they cried, it says to the Lord, they cried to him in sincerity, in intensity, in desperation. The Lord says, okay. And he raised up Ehud, the son of Gera. Verse 15 goes on to say, a Benjamite. The word Benjamin means son of my right hand. The right hand in Hebrew culture and Bible days, the right hand was the symbol of authority and strength and ability and power. And this guy, he was a Benjamite, Ehud was. But the problem was, verse 15 goes on to say he was a man what? Left-handed. Uh-oh. His name means son of my right hand, you know. He's a Benjamite. But he was a lefty. He was a southpaw. Now, it could be that he was born just being a southpaw. It could also equally be that he was handicapped, that his right arm, his right hand, as the margin of your Bible says, was shut out or shut up. That is, it could be that he was a handicapped person. But either way, whether he was born left-handed or whether he lost the use of his right hand, it was an enigma. Here's a guy whose name means son of my right hand, and yet he is a lefty. He must have thought, this is a mistake. How could it be that me, I'm a Benjamite, but look at me. I'm a left-handed guy. This doesn't make sense. And sometimes you, sometimes we look at ourselves and say, this just isn't right, Lord. You made a mistake when you made me this way with my big nose or my too brash personality or my shyness or my shortness or my tallness or whatever it might be, we look at how we are designed and sometimes we say, oh Lord, you made a mistake with me. Why didn't you make me more whatever it is that you wish you that you were more of? He felt that way, no doubt, growing up day after day. But he's left-handed. And by him, this guy named Ehud, the children of Israel sent a present to Eglon, the king of Moab. Now, what do you suspect they sent to Eglon, the king of Moab? I suggest to you it was food. They wanted to appease the fat guy. Let's just feed him. Let's get him off our back. Let's quiet him down. Let's send him a Big Mac. We'll send him food. Listen carefully. They sought to appease him. They sought to give a present to him. Verse 15 tells you and me. That is never the way to deal with sin. That big sin in your life, that thing that seems to dominate you, the temptation will be for you to say, well, I'll just feed it a little bit. One more, one more time, one more toke, one more sip, one more look, one more touch, one more whatever it is that you struggle with. Just If I could just feed this, this, this thing that, that is demanding this thing that is dominating, this thing that is, if I could just feed this thing and maybe he'll back off. Listen, you feed Eglon, you feed Jabba, all that happens is he gets fatter and the problem gets weightier. Lust is like a fire. The more that you feed a fire, the hotter it burns and the more it demands. And if you fall, if I fall, if we fall into that common misnomer, well, I'll just do it once more. I'll just have just a little bit, and maybe that will then satisfy the beast within me, the eglon that seems to be dominating me. Careful, it never works that way. If I, if you, if we give in just a little bit and try to appease him or it or that, it just gets heavier and more dominating and more demanding. So they gave this present to Eglon, big mistake. But now the plot thickens. Ehud, 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 this deliverer, the hero of our story, the guy whose name means son of my right hand, but who was left-handed, sad to say, he made him a dagger which had two edges of a cubit length. And he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh. I like this guy. Ehud, our hero. He goes out to his workshop. 
while others are getting burgers and shakes and french fries to feed Eglon and to appease him, Ehud knows what he needs to do. He goes out to his garage and he makes a great big sword, a two-edged dagger, and he puts it under his raiment on his right thigh. The sword, what does the sword speak of in the Bible? Hebrews 4 says, the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any what? Two-edged sword. The book of Ephesians chapter 6 says that we are to take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The word of God is likened in the Bible to a sword. The sword is a picture of the word of God, you see. What does he do? He takes the sword, he puts it underneath his raiment on his right thigh. He hides the word of God, even as Psalm 119 says, how shall a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed to the word, thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not, what? Sin against thee. The key to overcoming sin, the key to getting rid of Eglon and that oppression within is to take the scriptures and put them in my heart, to take the two-edged sword and put it just like this guy Ehud did when he put it underneath his raiment. Put the word of God, this sword, underneath your clothing. Put it in your heart. He does that. He puts it on his right thigh. Then they brought the present, verse 17, to Eglon, the king of Moab. No doubt this food, this stuff. And Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present. So they give Eglon this present. I believe, no doubt it would be food. Blah, great, thank you, he says, as he scarfs away. And then the guys, the people the, of Israel, they, they turn back and they go their way. And now, and when that happened, when they made an end to offering the present, Ehud sent the people away, but he himself turned back around again, verse 19, and went back to the palace of Eglon and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king. And Eglon says, a secret errand? <laughs> Keep silent. I mean, this guy, you know, hey, listen up, he's saying. A secret errand as he's wiping away the ketchup and the pickles, you know, and, and the milkshake stuff from his mouth that day. And all that stood by went out from him. And Ehud came near unto him. He was sitting in a summer parlor, that is, the king was sitting there in his summer area, which he had for himself alone. And Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he rose out of his seat. That is, Eglon, he, you can't even tell he's standing up, though. I mean, he just kind of rolls out of his seat. Oh, a message from God, some new recipe. Angel food cake, no doubt. You know, he was thinking something is grand. You know, after all, they just brought him a wonderful present previously. Oh, great, he says. At that point, Ehud, verse 21, put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh. It must have hit him like a bolt of lightning. He takes his left hand because he's left-handed. And he goes to his right thigh, and it must have hit him. right. That's why. That's why I'm left-handed. Because, you see, men in that day, being right-handed, would always keep their weapons if they were concealed on their left thigh, you draw across the body, you see. And so oftentimes when a guy would go into the presence of a king, the king's security people would sometimes get sloppy and would just then frisk the left side because guys are right-handed. But in this case, Ehud was left-handed. And if indeed he was handicapped, all the more reason to not be concerned about him. They checked him out quickly, no problem. He can talk to the king. I know now he must have thought in that moment, why I'm left-handed. God didn't make a mistake when he made me. It's all according to his purpose and his plan, his grand plan for me. Like that lady, Jan, she prayed as she was growing up. She prayed, oh, Lord, please change my brown eyes to blue. As she was three, four, five, and six, she would offer her prayers by her bed as little kids do with just such freedom and openness. Oh, God, please, if you love me, change my brown eyes to blue. Her eyes were never changed, obviously. 
She grows up and loves the Lord and goes overseas to India in the 60s where she is a missionary. She's serving in the northern provinces of India. During that time, there was a communist insurrection. And the communist guerrillas were taking control of village after village, including the village where Jan Morrison was a missionary. The communists surrounded the village. There was no way of escape, and they were killing all missionaries and all foreigners. The villagers cared about Jan. They, they valued what she was doing in their little town, their little village, and so they dressed her up like one of them, and they put a dye on her skin to make her look like an Indian, a person from India. And when those insurrectionists, those guerrillas, those communists came into that town hours later, they lined up the 150 people or so that resided in the village because they heard, they knew that somewhere there was a foreigner in the midst of that little village. And Jan was standing there too, dressed like a native Indian with dye on her skin. And those guerrillas went person to person to person, looking each one in the eye, trying to find if indeed there was a foreigner in the midst of them. And Jan tells a story of how she stood there when one of those guerrillas looked her right in the eye and then passed on by. And she says, it hit me then, Lord, that's why I have brown eyes. Because if I had blue eyes, no matter what clothes I put on or what dye I have on my skin, I would have been discovered and I would have been put to death in that moment, you see. God makes no mistakes in the way he makes you, in the way he makes me. You might say, well, I don't like my personality. Well, there's some reason that you're a jerk. You'll see. Hang in there. There's some reason you are the way you are. Me too. God makes you and makes me for purposes that only time will reveal, but it will. You watch, you wait, you'll see. I guarantee. And so here, Ehud, he takes his left hand. Ah, that's why as he grabs their the dagger that was under his garments from his right thigh, and he thrust this, this sword, verse 21. He takes it and thrusts it into Eglon's belly. I've got a secret message from God for you. Boom. And the haft, verse 22, also went in after the blade, and the fat closed upon the blade so he could not draw the dagger out of his belly. I mean, his eyes must have got as big as saucers when he watches this sword just go in, 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 and the blubber just blubbers, blubbers, blubbers over, and this huge sword is lost in the blubber of Eglon, and even the handle gets swallowed up too. <laughs> what an amazing story. I mean, he loses his sword in the guy's blubber, you see. He could not draw the dagger out of his belly. Verse 22, last phrase is amazing to me, and the dirt came out. Now, I don't know if Eglon was eating dirt, he was so hungry, or if it means that the stuff that he was eating wasn't washed, or if it means that it was his entrails or intestines, whatever it might be, the sword goes in and the dirt comes out. This is the key. How does a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed to the word. When the word goes in, the dirt comes out. Say that with me. The word goes in, the dirt comes out. Once more, the word goes in, the dirt comes. That's it. All of a sudden, man, he takes this sword and thrusts it into the belly of Eglon. And and the sword is enveloped, swallowed up by this guy's blubber, but then the dirt pours out. And Eglon goes down, and he dies. And the people are set free. And we'll finish this story on Wednesday night, but listen carefully. Set free. 18 years of bondage, 18 years of brutality, 18 years when Eglon dominated God's people mercilessly, they finally cry to the Lord, and here is the way God answers that cry, that prayer, by sending a man with a sword to deal with that oppressor. So too for me, so too for you, so too for us. Listen carefully. It's the word, it's the word, it's the word of God. It's the word. It's the word. You get in the word. You learn about the word. You give yourself to study of the word. You saturate your soul. You meditate on. You take time to study through. You really absorb the scriptures, and here's what will happen to you. When the sword goes in, the dirt comes out. You see. 
Eglon goes down. Sometimes a guy will come to me and say, John, would you pray for me because I'm struggling with lust? Would you pray for me because I'm struggling with integrity? Would you pray for me because I'm struggling with this or that or whatever it might be? And sometimes, oftentimes, I will say no. And they'll say, what? I'll say, I'm not going to pray for you. I'm going to give you a good piece of advice. Get in the Word. Get in the Word. Because you're not at Bible study. And you're not having devotions. And you're not starting your day in the Word. I, I know, you're not, are you? No, I'm not. Then a simple prayer is not going to be the solution to your dilemma. It's not going to be the answer to your problem. It's the Word of God. God wants you to be in communion with Him. To learn all kinds of things about Him. To really be knowledgeable of his way, his plan. And so he's not going to answer a simple prayer for you to be freed from that issue. But here's the key. You get in the word and you'll find something that happens. As the sword goes in, the dirt comes out. Hell shall a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed to the word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. It's the word, it's the word. Can I ask you this, old-time Christian? How's your daily devotions doing? How about this past week? Think back with me the last seven days. Did you start your days this week in the word? If so, guess what? The eglons that would have otherwise dominated you were going down right and left. If you didn't, then you struggled unnecessarily with things, attitudes, addictions, habits, tensions, anxieties, worries, depressions, problems, because the key is the word. How shall a young man cleanse his way? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. It's the scriptures. How you doing on Bible study? Are you learning the book of Judges? Are you learning the Gospel of John? Are you involved in Romans or Revelation or whatever it might be with your study group, whether it's here or some other church? But listen carefully. You need to be in the Word consistently, continually. I don't care if you're a new Christian or an old timer. If you're not having that time in the Word, things get real dark inside and you can go to all the meetings you want and say, oh, I wish I could be delivered from this darkness. But the way to be delivered from darkness is not to deal with the darkness, but to turn on the light. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. If I go into a dark room at home, I don't say, I bind you, darkness. <laughs> flee. In the name of PG&E, flee. Flee. You see, or whatever it might be. I can scream at the darkness. I can talk about the darkness. I can give you a telephone call and say, what should I do concerning the darkness? I can karate it, whatever it might be. It's not going to work. The key to overcoming darkness is simply to go to the switch and turn on the light, and the light will cause the darkness to flee. Folks, this book is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Sanctify them by truth. Thy word is truth, he prayed for you and me. It's the word. It's the word. It's the word. It's the word. And if you're not in the word, you're going to get dark inside and depressed and discouraged and defeated and you're going to have eglons getting fatter and bigger and dominating you day after day until finally one day you'll listen to what the word has to say. That's it. Lord, I'm crying to you. Make me a man, a woman of your word. I will do what your word tells me to. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin, that I will not sin against you. My way is going to be cleansed by taking heed to your word. That's what I'm going to do. Listen, John, why are you preaching? Why are you telling us this? Because I so desperately want every one of you to be men, to be women, every one of you to be people who are committed to going through the Bible day by day, talking to the Lord, learning about him. You say, but John, I can't remember what I read. It doesn't matter. 
People say to me all the time, my mind is like a sieve. And I say, yeah, well, the water of the word, even though your mind is a sieve, will give you a clean sieve. It'll wash through you. It'll have an impact on you for that day, for that time, you see. And you'll be surprised how much will stick with you ultimately. Just keep reading, keep studying. But it doesn't make sense it will. Be consistent in your reading. That's the key. Just keep reading. Eventually, it'll, it's like going skiing. The first time I went skiing, I hated it. Couldn't stand it. You know, you fall down. You can't even stand back up. Oh, the first time I went, my buddy, Bruce Bickle, and me, we took the gals we were dating up to ski up at Donner Springs or something like that up in the Sierra Nevada mountains. And they were real good. We were awful. We didn't know how to ski. So after a couple of hours, we just finally said, you, you, got, you go ski. Me and Bruce, will, we'll, we'll be here on the bunny hill. You go down the expert slopes or whatever. So we spent the day on the bunny hill, me and my buddy Bruce. We couldn't get it. It was awful. It was just terrible. And right about 3 o'clock, about an hour before the lifts close, we're there on the bunny slopes, falling down, getting wet, just hating what we're doing, hating life. And then about 3 o'clock or so, it was crazy because Bruce is, you know, trying to get going, and I'm with him, and, and boom, his knee pops out. It just popped out to the side. Just came, you know, he had this bad knee, and it just kind of boom, popped right out. He fell down and was in pain, and I freaked out. Oh, no, my buddy, you know, this skiing stuff is not only stupid, it's dangerous, see. So I, I went down the hill to get help for him. Amazing. This is an absolutely true story. I went down the hill to get help for him, and when I went down the hill to get help for him, it was the first time all day I didn't fall. And I was so amazed and so pleased I got back in line to go back up again. And I forgot all about Bruce, and I went down several times, and... and <laughs> Lucky somebody else saw the dilemma and went and got the guys to take him down the bunny slope and all that. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's that way, you know, skiing or sports activities can so often be like that. You know, you struggle, you don't get it, and then boom, all of a sudden it clicks. So too with the word. I don't get this, man. This, I just don't get it. Stay with it. And what you'll find is, oh, hey, the word of God is a sharp two-edged sword. That's how this applies to this Eglon Ehud story, you see. Now, why did I see that when I first started teaching that 25 years ago? Because I was reading the book of Hebrews at the time in my own devotionals. The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. And you begin to make connections. But I read this story many times before I really understood how it applied to me personally. So too for you. You stick with it. Well, yeah, but in the meantime, if I'm not making the application, it's still feeding your soul. It's still cleaning your mind. It's still driving out the darkness within. Listen, folks, be consistent. Be committed to your personal Bible study, to Bible group times, too, that we do here or wherever you might go, but get involved in a good Bible study and grow and grow. Eglon will get wiped out. As the sword goes in, the dirt comes out. Guarantee. Absolutely. Read consistently. Read conversationally. Talk to the Lord while you're reading. Talk. This is the way the Lord speaks to you is this book that's in your hand. After you read a sentence or two, stop and talk to him. It's two-way communication. Jesus said, in this you think you have life, but these are they which speak of me, he said, concerning the scriptures. Talk to me. I could call Tammy on the telephone. I could say, Tammy... Listen, and I could talk, 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 hang up. See, now I've talked to her. Or I could have a dialogue. Listen, talk, talk, talk. Now you talk to me, and then she talks to me. Talk, 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 you know. <laughs> or I can say, Tommy, let's, let's talk back and forth. Let's really communicate. And I'll say a sentence or two, and she'll say a sentence or two, and I'll say a sentence or ten, and she'll say another one or whatever it might be. We go back and forth. That's what Bible study is to be. Whether you're sitting in the amphitheater or having devotions in the morning, it's to be, Lord, ah, oh, got it. Yes, Lord, there is an eglon in my heart. And yes, Lord, there is depression in my life. And yes, Lord, I have not read your word in a number of days. And Bible study is no longer a priority in our family schedule. No wonder, Lord, this is getting heavy. No wonder I'm being discouraged. No wonder it's dark. Lord, I get it again. And if you've prayed that way, even sitting here today, God is going to be setting you free. It's a communication that takes place, you see. Read expectantly, not just consistently and conversationally, but read expectantly. Expect God to speak to you. How does that happen? 
I suggest if you haven't yet learned this, it's a good thing to do. When you have your Bible study times or your devotionals, keep a pencil and paper handy. I believe that if a person has a pencil and paper handy, they are saying, I expect to hear something from God that is worth jotting down. And when I don't have a pencil and paper handy in my devotions or my Bible study or sermons I listen to, what I am essentially saying is, I expect to hear nothing worth remembering. And God says, okay, gotcha. That's exactly what you're going to get, nothing. But if I come say, Lord, I expect to hear from you today. In my devotions, I have my journal open. If I'm at a Bible study, I have a pencil and paper. I'm saying, Lord, I expect that you're going to speak to my heart. Something worth jotting down, a verse, a thought, a reminder, a sentence, a word of prophecy, whatever it might be. Listen, Habakkuk was wrestling through issues. And he said, I will go to the tower and I will see what the Lord will say to me. And the Lord said to him, Habakkuk, write the vision and make it plain. What if Habakkuk said, oh, I forgot my pencil. See, Habakkuk went there because he knew he needed to hear from the Lord. He was in a state of expectancy. He had pencil and paper or pen and scroll handy. He expected to hear. This is such a key. This is such a key. I'm always trying to help people to see this. If you don't approach the word with a spirit of expectancy, you're not going to get what you otherwise would have. Come to the Lord and say, Lord, I expect to hear from you today. Read consistently, read conversationally, read expectantly with pencil and paper in hand saying, I expect, Lord, I'm going to hear from you during this devotional time or during this Bible study or whatever it might be. Number four, number four, finally, read obediently. Lord, what you say I'm going to do today, if you say rejoice, I'm going to start rejoicing right now. If you say lift up your heart with your hands, that's what I'm going to do. If you say put away lying, then that's my goal. That's my intention for this day. Because if I don't read obediently, here's the reality, kids. God's not going to give me more information if I already have failed to do what he's told me to previously. Well, I'm not getting anything out of the word. What's the last thing he showed you? Well, that I was to worship. Have you done that? I don't know. Well, then why would he tell you something else? Why would he stack up your inbox? Why would he clutter up your desk spiritually with more and more to do? He gives you one thing, one thing for me, and he says, do this and more information will come your way. That's the key. Oh, folks, I know I've taken a long time. I've taken advantage of the cloud covering. Besides, you can sleep in, you're off tomorrow, all that stuff. But this is important stuff. Would you be people of the word? Don't let Eglon dominate over you for another day. Cry out to the Lord. And then do what he tells you to. The deliverer. The one who sent your way. Jesus Christ comes to you and says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Thy word is truth, he prayed to the Father. It's the word of God. Be a lover of this book. Be a student and a disciplined one in your taking in the scriptures day after day it'll make all the difference i guarantee eglon will go down and you'll be set free if you become a person who says starting today lord i'm gonna be disciplined in the taking in of your word i guarantee you'll be blessed let's pray father i know that I have allowed too often too many eglons to dominate because I have not utilized, Lord, the power and potency of your word. But I thank you for continuing to be patient with me, with us, in the way that you do. And I pray in the name of Jesus, Father, that you would cause us, Lord, to see once again this day that you have given us a potent, powerful weapon in your word, that we, like David, a man after your own heart, might say that we have hid your word in our heart, that we might not sin against you. So, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that this would be a time, a season, in which many of us would rediscover the potency of your word. Lord, even if we feel klutzy or left-handed, whatever it might be, your word is powerful and will grant us victory. Work these things in. In Jesus' name I do pray, Lord.